Hello, this is Michelle from Physioactive Indonesia bringing to you our Singapore Surgeon Insight Series. Today, joining us is Professor Lo Ngai Nung, Specialist in Orthopedic Surgery from the Orthopedic Specialist Practice, Singapore. Can you tell us a bit about yourself, your qualifications and your experiences, please? Right. Uh, well, uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon and my uh, area of practice, my area of interest is in uh, degenerative arthritis, in, uh, that is uh, uh, joint pains in the elderly and in particular uh, knee arthritis and hip arthritis. So I've been working in this field for the past uh, 30 years since my uh, fellowship training in the United States. I was in the United States. I was one of the earliest uh, surgeons of Singapore sent to the United States to uh, learn uh, joint replacement surgery. And uh, things have really evolved since then. I say I really learned a lot over time in my 30 years of practice. So, so right now, uh, my practice deals mostly with uh, the elderly presenting with joint pains, knee pains, pains and needing uh, surgery and advice. That's long years of practice, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> right. So today we will be addressing the knee replacement, an extremely effective treatment for knees that are worn out or diseased. Doctor, can you give us a bit of a background about our knee, which is one of the largest and most complex joint in our body? Right. So. Uh, I have a model here, and this is uh, looking at the knee joint. Uh, this is the front view, right? The femur, the thigh is on top, the shin, the tibia below, and the kneecap in the center. So you can see the knee joint is a, a very unique joint. It takes a lot of load. We walk, we stand, we run, and it's designed to take load. And yet it has to be flexible. It must allow us to be able to bend, to squat, to you know, do ballet, do dance, and yet it must have enough, uh, and it must have enough stability, and yet be flexible, and still be able to take all the loads that we transmit across the knee uh, when we do heavy manual work, you know, when we run and jump. So you can see it's a very unique knee, uh, unique joint, uh, uh, kneecap in front, the bones covered at the ends by cartilage. And then having this uh, cushions, this meniscus cushions that absorb stress and the ligaments at the side to, to allow us to move and yet provide stability. Uh, and because it's such, a, it's, it's such a unique joint providing uh, stability yet flexibility and yet even, uh, able to take a lot of loads. So in a way, um, if it gets damaged, it can give a lot of trouble. So, you know, um, this joint, among all the joints in the body, is often the one that first gets into uh, trouble with active living. So what is the um, first step from, uh, from this point onwards? Do we immediately have to see a surgeon or are there particular symptoms before you decide it's serious enough to have to see a doctor or a surgeon for that matter. Right. So here we're talking of, uh, in particular, the group of the elderly patients uh, who present to us. And uh, it's not common for a lot of old folks who have some aches and pains now and then after activity uh, <clears throat> or overloading. But when the problem becomes persistent or recurrent, yeah, uh, over a period of time, let's say, you know, over a month, two months, and the pain doesn't go away, it's still uh, there or getting worse. Or if it's associated with recurrent swelling, you know, the knee is swollen up, red, warm, swollen. And, uh, or if the knee is uh, <clears throat> uh, stiff, you know, locking, jamming, it wouldn't bend. It, it, you can only bend it to uh, like halfway and then it gets stuck. And these are the symptoms that make you start thinking maybe it's more than the usual rheumatism pain or elderly aches and pains. So I think we're looking up for uh, mechanical uh, uh, derangements, mechanical jamming, 
hurting, um, swelling, inflammation, or if the patient has a lot of deformity, a very bad, like bow legged deformity, she's walking unstable, waddling. Uh, so when these problems become recurrent, chronic, such that they affect the patient's daily function or they affect the patient's quality of life, they start to give up uh, doing things that they love to do, like they, they like they previously they could go out independently, they could work, and now they are fine that they are housebound because they can no longer do these things. Now's the time they start thinking maybe they should see a doctor for advice to see how they could improve upon the function. It's one of the risk factors that would make a patient more likely to uh, have uh, arthritis on the knee joint. Age is an issue because it's a degenerative problem. But unfortunately, all of us get, get age and we age, so we can't, we can't change that. But there are certain factors that, that uh, we can look into and make alterations to lower these risk issues. So weight, as you brought up, is an important issue. Yeah, obviously, if you are gross, the patient is grossly overweight, high uh, BMI, then of course, it increases his uh, chance of uh, developing wear and tear in the joint. Yeah. Uh, and if you use that as an example, for every extra kilogram you put on your body, body weight, then the weight at the knee joint is actually increased fourfold, four kilograms force. So you will put on 10 extra kilograms, you put on 40 extra kilogram force on the knee joint. Then obviously that increases your chance of damaging, wearing down the knee joint. So that's one, uh, your, your body weight. Number two, obviously, is your muscle strength. Because uh, if you have strong muscles, it helps cushion the load across the knee. So again, if you are getting older and you fail to maintain your a good set of uh, knee muscles, maintain your body size muscle strength, then again, you start to put more load onto the joint and you increase the chance of injury and damage to the joint arteries. So our first two advice is always to the patient, keep yourself nice and trim, yet yeah, keep your muscles nice and strong. And that's part of healthy, healthy aging. Other things that could affect would be if you uh, um, doing like high impact activities, you know, as you get older, you try to go on to low impact activities. Or if your work is such that it's heavy manual labor, you know, then of course that could affect. Or if you have knee injury, you know, if you're still doing certain uh, occupations or sports that we predispose you to injury, then of course that would be uh, another additional risk factor to uh, joint damage. So uh, yes, this will be the appropriate things that we can change in our lifestyle. Okay, so now if a patient from a patient perspective if we have pain and we decide to come and see a surgeon what are the steps in the assessment that we can expect when we visit the surgeon for the knee right so so when you see a, an orthopedic surgeon with a let's say a painful knee a painful stiff knee an arthritic knee so invariably the first part will be a very detailed history the doctor wants to know uh, about the background behind this knee, uh, this knee pain. How long has it been bothering the patient? Was there an injury that started this? Uh, what sort of uh, treatment has the patient had? What sort of response to the treatment had the patient had? Was there previous surgery involved? So a very detailed history is important. Firstly, to ascertain uh, why the patient comes with this knee damage. And number two is to find out uh, how does the, this knee trouble uh, affect his daily life, his quality of life, his daily function. And then, of course, to find out how he has responded to whatever other treatments that have been offered. So with this in mind, then, of course, we can uh, offer an opinion and a treatment plan uh, that is more uh, personalized to the patient's lifestyle. But the second thing, of course, will be... Uh, careful clinical examination of the patient. Basically, we really want to know is, is that pain really coming from the knee or could it be uh, referred pain from elsewhere? You know, is the joint uh, stiff? You know, is there swelling in the joint? Is the, is the 
to enjoy him play. Or is a knee bow legged, you know, is there a malalignment problem? Is there a language discrepancy problem? So, a detailed clinical examination, not only of the knee, but overall holistically looking at a patient, you see overweight, there's the muscles weak, you know, you see associated uh, spine and hip problems that contribute to this. And then, lastly, of course, there'll be some investigations. And most of the time, we will do x rays uh, of the patient's uh, joint, often with the patient standing up, weight bearing to see uh, if there's significant uh, narrowing of the joint space. Yes. So, something like that uh, good history, a thorough physical examination, and x rays. Okay, so can we perhaps discuss the possible treatments or uh, solutions before resorting to surgery. Yeah. And, and what you say is absolutely right. Uh, because when we're dealing with uh, degenerative joint disease, arthritis, the first thing is to note is this is not a life-threatening disorder. This is a functional disability. So surgery is never like uh, the first thing you mention to the patient. So you always talk to the patient like, uh, what are the non-surgical options? Because the patient's main complaint is usually pain, stiffness, uh, deformity. So you can handle a lot of these problems, uh, reducing the pain through telling the patient things like losing weight, strengthening the muscles, getting rid of the stiffness and improving the muscle strength through exercise therapy, uh, seeing a good physiotherapist to uh, guide you on this. Uh, simple things like perhaps using a walking stick. You know, patients feel that they are very shy by using a stick. But sometimes a simple stick, a nice lightweight hiking stick, takes a lot of load off the joint and uh, allows them to um, get a lot more function out of the joint without pain. And then lastly, of course, managing the symptoms through pain medication, which can be topical, rub on, stick on, plasters, oral medications, or even uh, injections. So if you have got a patient with Good health, low risk issues, and really wants to get back this, uh, get back a pain free knee. Uh, then surgery is a good option. If a patient requires surgery, what would the surgery entail? Maybe you can give us a brief explanation on the procedure involved. Okay. Yes. So if we go back to this this knee model, and we say that with time, the knee gets damaged. The damage would be in the articular cartilage. This blue surface covering cartilage gets degenerate, worn, torn, or in the meniscus, the cushions, the cushions get worn off. Yeah. So obviously, when you are 60 years and above, when the cartilage and the meniscus get damaged and worn, you can't you can't regenerate them, you can't grow them back. Then of course, the next best thing we can offer for them will be so-called a uh, man-made implant. So something like that, where we replace the damaged surfaces with a metal plastic uh, implant. Yeah. So, uh, so what happens is this. This is what the actual implant looks like. It is a metal cap. Okay, it is a metal cap. Let me just go yeah. uh, about eight to nine millimeters thick. Uh, the shape is a curvature similar to that of our natural knee surface curvature. And the whole idea is to cover the damaged articular surface, the cartilage damaged cartilage surface, with this smooth uh, polished uh, uh, metal cap. So similarly, below is a plastic tray uh, sitting on a titanium platform. And this is supposed to take the place of the damaged cartilage, the damaged meniscus on top of the tibia. So if you could imagine during surgery, we would sort of smoothen the articular surface, the surface, damaged surface of the tip of the knee. We stick on this platform with a piece of plastic mm -hmm. that is now the new so-called man-made cartilage uh, meniscus replacement. And then similarly, on the femur side, we would uh, sort of clean up and smoothen the damaged uh, surface of the femur and put a metal cap on it. 
So basically, it's a resurfacing procedure. It is a procedure where we replace the damaged uh, moving part, moving surface of the knee with a man-made implant. Now, if you do that, obviously now when you walk, you no longer have pain because it's no longer bone rubbing to bone. The surfaces are nice and smooth again, so you can be able to bend your knee as you as you sit, yeah, to climb the stairs, and you restore back the alignment because the knee was uh, often the leg, the, the knee is bow legged because of damage, but by putting the implants, you get the knee nice and uh, neutral aligned again. Okay, so this would be a full uh, knee replacement. Is there such a thing as a partial or a, solu a possible solution of a partial knee replacement? Yes. And this is uh, <clears throat> in the more recent years when we have ability to, instead of doing a complete replacement, we could just do half a replacement, as you can see here. Yeah. So in the, in the patient who comes in the earlier stage of the condition where the damage is localized, so let's say you can see that they just have a torn cartilage meniscus on one side, or it just worn down the cartilage on one side, but the other side still remains nice. Then they may not need a, a, a full replacement. They can just do a partial, you know, partial replacement like that. Mm -hmm. And you can see the metal cap over right. the toe femur and the plastic below. So this one is a smaller version. You can see it's a much smaller version of the previous one. The implants are much, much smaller. Mm -hmm. So the advantage is that this is a smaller, less invasive surgery. And patients like that, the older patients like that because it's quick recovery, <coughs> smaller surgery, um, less blood loss, easier, uh, more natural feeling. You know, they, they feel that it's more like their own knee. They can squat and bend. And uh, often patients, even patients with risk issues like diabetes, heart disease, kidney failure, they can go for this partial replacement with much lower risk okay. because it's much smaller surgery in a sense. So how long would these, uh, both the partial and the full knee surgery take? And if we have travel plans or we need to plan the itinerary, can you give us a brief um details about this as in wh when is the follow-up checkup and uh, the recovery process right so the the surgery on average takes about one and a half hours one and a half hours uh, surgical time often the patient will be in the operating room uh like two two and a half to three hours because the first one hour is spent uh, uh sterilizing the and preparing the patient uh, anesthesia, putting the patient to sleep, making them comfortable. And then, of course, at the end of surgery, we also keep them for another 30 minutes monitoring before we send them back to the ward. But the actual surgery is much shorter. Um, the, um, the day after surgery, we start physiotherapy. And the idea is that the earlier we get them out of bed, the better the outcome for the patient. Lying in bed doesn't... Uh, Make the patient better. <laughs> they, get, they get worse every day lying in bed. So the patient really wants to be out of bed the next day with the therapist, uh, taught exercises to move the knee to prevent stiffness, to strengthen the muscles, uh, taught to balance, you know. So usually by the second day, they can get out of bed. By the third day, we start making them do more things uh, walk down the corridor. We teach them how to climb stairs. Which leg to walk first, which leg to come down. And we would want them to be so called confident. That means they can get out of bed by themselves, sit to stand, go to the bathroom, come back by themselves, holding on to a, a walking stick or quad stick. Now, if you can do that, then we start planning to send them home out of the hospital. So, usually by the uh, third day, most of them should be able to be confident enough to. To go home. Uh, of course, this varies depending on the patient's age, the patient's uh, other medical issues. Uh, for the partial knees, usually two nights, three days, they're good, good to go. For the total knees, probably uh, you know three nights, they're good to go. Okay, 
So do they have to come back for a follow-up checkup with you before they travel back to Indonesia? This is in, of course, um, speaking for Indonesian patients that plan to come to Singapore to do their surgery with you, doctor. Yes, and uh, absolutely right. So we will definitely want to see them before they go home. So usually if possible, after they go back to the hotel, they go back to the hotel for the next uh, two or three nights, and they come back again, and we just want to make sure they are coping well. They are, they are managing well uh, in terms of their uh, exercises and ability to walk. We also check to make sure they have no complications. There is no infection, no fever, the wound is dry and clean, no bleeding. There's no uh, in vitro thrombosis, no swelling. Uh, if they have no complications, they are coping well with their therapy, they are confident, their pain is well managed. Then they can quite uh, confidently head home to, to back to Indonesia. And we always emphasize that uh, when they go back, they have to continue exercises, physiotherapy, if necessary, to see a good physiotherapist or supervise exercises. Uh, and they would then uh, be told to update us on their progress. But ultimately, of course, we want to see them uh, be able to walk go shopping, go to the market, uh, stick free, eat free. But we're looking at, like for total knee replacement, we're looking at like two to three months or for partial replacement, half that time, one to two months. Yeah. Okay. So so this, this uh, timing varies based on their overall age and fitness. Uh, so, so we do tell the patients that if they want to recover fast, then obviously, they have to spend uh, some effort working on their muscle strength, mm -hmm. regaining the uh, joint flexibility, their balance. So it's, it's always a two-way thing. Uh, the surgeon does good surgery, manages the patient post up well so that they have good pain control and keeps them out of trouble for complications. And the patient must do his part. T typically, it's always uh, older folk who who invariably has, uh, uh, you know, become wheelchair bound and, uh, uh, you know, give, lost his ability to go out independently and comes in quite depressed because of loss of his uh, independent living. And I think to a lot of older folks to lose their ability to live independently, to enjoy their social life and to be able to do things on their own without needing assistance. Uh, Makes, makes a lot of difference to them, their self-pride, their ability to care for themselves. So I think uh, nowadays in our generation, there are a lot of ways to resolve this, and surgery is one way. Obviously, the elderly patients have uh, a lot of uh, inhibition, inhibition, anxiety, and fear when they do surgery. But uh, that's, that's common. Nobody likes surgery. But we look at the big picture, the modern techniques of surgery, very safe nowadays, with uh, very good uh, results, uh, with very smooth uh, recovery. So thank you for that assurance for our viewers, doctor. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time and um, information. Yes. For our viewers, if you are interested in speaking with Professor Long Ai Nung, you can call plus six five. 62652388 or WhatsApp plus 6583186243 to schedule an appointment. You can visit their website at www.ospr.com.sg for more details. If you are planning to get your surgery in Singapore and live in Jakarta, you can start your physiotherapy at Physioactive Singapore and continue your rehabilitation program in Physioactive Indonesia. On behalf of our entire team at Physioactive Indonesia, we want to thank you for tuning in and we look forward to bringing you more top quality content from leading industry surgeons.